Does intentionality play a part in company culture? Did you know that 225% of people are more productive when inspired? And can you create a company culture remotely? The answer might surprise you. Meet Josh Dykstra. Josh is a TEDx speaker and recognized thought leader on the future of work and company culture. With articles published in Fast Company, Forbes, and the Huffington Post, among others. He is the author of Igniting the Invisible Tribe, Designing an Organization that Doesn't Suck, and is the CEO of Love Work, a platform that creates astonishingly great places to work. He's personally worked with some of the most iconic brands on earth, Apple, Chanel, Tony, USC, Genetech and Microsoft, among others, and is a co-founder and the podcast host of The Work Revolution. Also, make sure and stick around as Josh explains why your organization, as he calls it, needs a crap load of flexibility. Hey, Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. We're so glad to have you and to talk about this uh, really wonky topic called company culture. And I feel like it's always been a thing after COVID. It seems like it's become like kneeling jello to a wall type of thing. Everyone has an opinion. Can you create it remotely? Can you not create it remotely? There's so many thoughts and not just thoughts, but really strong feelings around it. Um, yeah. Let's just start with what is culture? What does company culture mean yeah. when we say that in 2023? Yeah, absolutely. But I think one of the great things the pandemic did was actually bring this this topic to light in a way that that it mm. wasn't really talked about pre pandemic, because this has mm -hmm. always been a challenge. Right? I've I've been talking about this for I don't know, fifteen years, and people you know, well before me for twenty, thirty, fifty years. Some right, so it's like this is not a new topic, but it feels like it's new on the stage uh, of mm. of awareness for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, in order to understand culture, though, I really recommend not thinking about culture because culture is ah, almost that's almost in, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but it's so complex, right? You look up culture in the mm -hmm. dictionary, and it's just like this string of words that's just it gets bizarrely complex so fast because this mm. amalgamation of all these different things, right, that that kind of come into mm. this like melting pot, and that makes your culture, and it's it gets really confusing uh, really quickly. And so what we recommend is using uh, a different metaphor to understand culture, which is an operating system. So think about like, you might, you might not think about the operating system on your phone or your computer very often, unless you're a big nerd like me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But those, that operating system, right, whether it's on your phone or your computer or whatever, like that operating system is controlling everything on the device, mm. right? What mm. can be installed, what can run, what can work, what doesn't work, you know, how things work. Uh, everything mm, is controlled by the operating system. And, and that's actually what culture is. It's the operating system of your business. And so when you start to understand culture as an operating system, A, it becomes more tangible, right? It's like, oh, mm -hmm. I can kind of like understand it a little better. It, and it becomes, you know, B, it becomes a lot less, less complex, right? Because the yeah, operating like system Jell -O is to the wall. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It feels less like that, right? An operating system is still complex. There's a lot of things happening, but we, we can build these things, right? We can upgrade mm. these things. Mm. And so it's just a, it's just a better way to, to think about culture. Uh, I found. I absolutely love that definition of it. And it does make it more tangible. Why does company culture matter in an organization? Cause we look yeah. at some big box retailers. I think we can all think of a number of them <clears throat> that really don't have a company culture and it's very void of humanity. And then you can yeah. also probably think of like, Starbucks and you go in and there's going to be a green apron and you're going to get a hello, welcome to Starbucks. And yeah. it doesn't matter how many 15 items you have on your drink order. It's met with a smile. Like why does company culture matter? Yeah. Yeah. And just, and I would offer a small kind of adjustment there, which is that all companies have a Please culture. Now, some cultures might not be well, good, right? To your, to your point, I think is what you meant is like a good that's culture. That's very fair. Right. But they all do. All companies have an operating system, but some, some of their, some companies operating systems are, are designed to treat people like garbage. Um, and <laughs> so right, true. So what you're I think talking about oh. are cultures that are good, right? They're, mm -hmm. they, they're designed to actually treat people well. And so that's a different thing. And it's a much more rare thing, right? To find, find a I cultural agree. system, right? Cultural operating system that's actually designed to, uh, you know, optimize for humanity, uh, 
that's why I have a job, yeah. right? Because a lot of a lot of companies don't do that very well. Um, but it matters. Well, and it it's takes tremendous intentionality, amount, right? right? Like it's not just going to arbitrarily it, it happen. Takes, that's how does. you end up with a culture devoid of that human element. It doesn't. Exactly. Exactly. That's what happens, right? It's it's entropy in action. It's it's dis- and, you know it disintegrates to to the point of of kind of you know most companies we see that that aren't particularly human centric. Uh, that's kind of what mm-hmm. happens with that. It's like an untended garden, right? Like what happens mm-hmm. if you don't tend the garden, right? It becomes full of weeds and it becomes kind of a mess. Um, so mm-hmm. you, it does take a lot of intentionality, but goodness, it matters, right? Because which which you know, right? If you if you if you've been to a company that treats its people yeah. well, you know those people treat their customers better, right? They bring in better ideas, they collaborate better. There's less tension, right? They and they're better at like pretty much every business metric across the board, if you measure it over the long term, is better in a company that has better culture, right? So it's, it's better mm-hmm. for your people. It's better for business. Uh, you know, the the only thing that kind of so gets agree. hard for people is, <laughs> yeah, is when we have a if we adopt a short term view of the world, uh, you know, this this doesn't compute as well. But if you have any kind of longer term uh, view of what's happening in business. Uh, creating a better culture is a, a no-brainer. Oh, it's critical because, like you said, yeah. your internal stakeholders, i.e., your employees, your contractors, are going to feel it, and that directly yep. affects the outputs to those external stakeholders, which are the ones writing it your does. paycheck. And it does. so there's a there's a They're more... massive continuum there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just give you, I mean, there's tons of stats on this, right? If, if people want to really dig into it. this and they're like, I don't believe you, Josh, right about like th- that this is true. I would just say, go read a book called Firms of Endearment. Um, and uh, I'll mm-hmm. give you one stat, which is pretty, pretty crazy, uh, which is about directly productivity, right? So if we want to just talk about a you know, hardcore business kind of measurement, right? Productivity. Uh, mm-hmm. If we mm-hmm. get to the level where your employees can say that they're inspired, by their work, oh, wow. by their culture, by the right, they are they are two hundred twenty five percent more productive than if you were oh, just that's satisfied. Breathtaking. Really, right? And this is like so you can write, and these are satisfied people, right? So they're they're satisfied. Which you think is job, good enough? You, they're not leaving. Well, a lot of people they're do. They're happy. Right? They're good. Right. But it's not good yeah. enough. It's it's not even close to what you could be doing. Right? You're leaving so mm-hmm. much money on the table uh, by not inspiring your people. So the question becomes the how. Um, yeah. If I'm sitting here and I have, let's say, one or two employees or I have one or two contractors I work intimately with and I'm like, gosh, Josh, I'm not even sure. You're right. I do have some co- sort of company culture, but I really don't know what it is. Mm. Where do you start with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I know this absolutely. is important, but what do I do with this? Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're in a, in a small firm, right? You've got a, you've got a lot of opportunity to kind of craft this. And, and again, it, it does start with what you said earlier. It starts with just being intentional, like realizing mm-hmm. that it exists, whether you, you realize it or not, it's there. And so just by putting some of your attention on it and saying, Hey, this is, this is happening, right? There's an operating system mm-hmm. here in my business running in the background. And if I don't intentionally craft it, I will be running a default operating system that's from a whole bunch of other patterns and other crap that I've gotten from other places that I've worked, <laughs> so well other said. managers that, right? Other managers that I've worked for, yeah. right? Like that becomes the default software that's running in your business if you don't intentionally make it different. Mm. So I would mm. say the first step is just to get intentional. And at the moment you start to put your intentionality towards it, it will get better because you're paying attention to it, just mm-hmm. like any other part of your business, right? Your finances aren't going to get, right? Nothing's going to happen there unless you pay attention to them. You, your nothing's going to happen with your marketing unless you pay attention to it, right? You put your attention on the culture, even a little bit, it will start to improve it. Um, and the next thing I would think of, think about or encourage people to think about is really uh, start to pay attention to what energizes people. Uh, more yeah. and, and what drains people, right? So if you can, if you can start to be intentional about crafting a culture or an operating system that actually brings people energy throughout their mm-hmm. work day, mm-hmm. almost everything else will start to work better for you. Like if you just use that one principle and put that at the center of what you're doing, everything gets better. So I would I would start there, and we can go into more detail on any of this if you if no. you want to. 
I think this is great because a lot of times we just think of stress so negatively, but any psychologist mm. will tell you there's positive stressors and there's negative mm. stressors. And if you don't get up in the morning and go, yeah, I've got a bunch of dragons to slay today. And in the words of Pat Benatar, hit me with your best shot. Like I am ready to do this. If that isn't where you're at, it's time to take a step back and say, wait, where is that spot for me? If it's, oh gosh, I got six hours of meetings and then I got to return all those emails. And if that's what's where you're at and that's the emotional tone of your subconscious throughout the day, that is an immense waste of the abilities you've been given to change the world in a significant way. I think everybody has them. It's just teasing them out and being brave enough to pursue them because you're not going to give to your organization. Yep. You're not going to give to your clients. And most importantly, you're not giving to yourself. Yeah. 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 We talk about this a lot in, in the, um, in the frame of flow states, right? So mm-hmm. if you've, if you've been, I don't know if, if your listeners are familiar with this or not, but quick, quick thing, you know, if you're not familiar oh, no, with give flow, us the overview. you are, yeah. uh, <laughs> right. Because what being in flow is it's being in the zone. Right. So it's like, you know, you, you're working on something and then you, and you're so engrossed in it, you forget to eat lunch and you look up and it's two hours later and you're still, and you're really energized and you're really focused, but that's a flow state, right? So most Mm -hmm. of us have experienced this, even if we don't have a name for it, right? We often call it, you know, being in the zone or something like this. Uh, We see it a lot more in kind of like music or sports, right? But what we're trying to do is say, how do you get in that, that state at work, and I think that's mm. you know, kind of what you're you're hinting at, right? It's like, how do you get into that place more frequently? Uh, yeah. And so, what there is with a flow state is there's a there's a, a kind of a a connection between skill and challenge. So if you can imagine, even like a like an axis mm. here, you got skill and challenge. What you okay. got to do is actually like push yourself a little bit further on the challenge part than the amount of skill you have. Right. So to, kind of to your point, right. With, with, you know, the, the challenges yeah. that we want to face, right. We want it to be meaningful, but that's where you find yourself able to get into a flow state when you're challenging yourself a little bit beyond your skill level in a zone of energy, right. Something you like to do. That's something that brings you energy. And if you do more of those kinds of things and keep pushing yourself on that edge, you'll be able to find yourself in a flow state more at work. So what happens if, I'm sitting on the other end of the spectrum and I don't have one or two contractors, but maybe I have 20 employees in my design Mm. firm and I'm feeling like maybe we have just lost our way and gotten clunky as we have grown and we've lost some of our agility, which we know is a core business function. How do we... How do we start to redefine a culture? Because I think when you're part of a large organization or you're the principal of a large organization, it often feels like turning the Titanic and yeah. making those incremental changes can be really challenging. What would you say to yeah. that person who's listening today? Yeah. Yeah. Most most of these things all kind of start in the same spot. Um, so it, okay. it doesn't actually vary that much, you know, the size of your or That's based on the size of your, your organization. Um, <clears throat> it, what it really really depends on is a leader who's got the guts to do it right mm, and because this mm. isn't an overnight thing even in a even in a small boat it can feel like turning a titanic right it's just like <laughs> it can. it's it these <laughs> right these things are hard these things are hard and it's, it, they're mm. hard because most of us aren't used to working this way right most of us are not, not used all. to working in a culture that optimizes for our energy most of us are 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 used to working in a culture that's the opposite, right? It's the yeah. most organizational yeah. structures are designed to use you as the battery, right? We suck you, your yeah, energy Yeah, they suck out. you dry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> yep. So what I'm talking about is, is really just the opposite of that, right? It's that mm-hmm. there are organizational structures that actually give humans energy. And when they do, everything works mm-hmm. better, right? Because your people aren't so drained, Right, like, because you're you're not drained, right? You're, so agree. Right, it just makes it just makes sense, right? It's logical, but it's hard because we, it's nothing most of us have seen or experienced, sure. right? But there are plenty of organizations out there. I promise you, we've you know, me and partners of mine over the years have been cataloging these. There's tons of them that are really trying to do mm. work differently, but it's mm-hmm. not the default path, and and that's the hard part. Whether you're a tiny company or an enormous company, this is not the default path. And so, again, it goes back to that kind of intentionality. Um, 
we've got some resources that we'd be happy to share. You know, if people want to go down this great. path, we'll put them in the show uh, notes for sure. Ha- yep. Happy to share, uh, with your listeners. Um, something that we really highly recommend is something like a culture book or a culture deck. Uh-huh. Right? So, so what, one of the things you really need to do is start articulating the, the yeah. prime kind of tenets or principles of what you want your culture to be. Um, mm-hmm. Because if you don't get it out on paper, if you don't turn it into a constitution of sorts yep. that people can yep. read and agree to or not agree to and go work somewhere else. Yeah. And say it's have not no a good fit. Co- it's a, I'm out. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But without that, you'll have no collective agreements that people can mm-hmm. rally around. So getting mm-hmm. it out of the, the founders' heads and onto paper is one of the, the most important things you can do. Making these things into behavioral statements is really important. We call mm-hmm. these things vital behaviors. Like what are the things that are just non-negotiable if you want to work here? Right? There's lots of places you can work, but if you want to work here, this is how we do it. Right. So I can share some of those things though with you as, as resources, but that would be the the place I would start too. Whether you're in we a big company or, or a tiny one. Well, and I think that's what's what's interesting too is the word that comes to mind as you're talking is unapologetic. It's mm-hmm. just we this is who we are unapologetically. And you can either get on the train, so to speak, and drink the Kool-Aid. Um, I'm thinking Dutch Brothers Coffee, another one that has a super strong company culture. Or yeah. you can say no, I'd rather have a milk toast culture, go in, log my eight to five and say goodbye at the end of the day. I don't know yeah. very many people who want to do that, but at least then there's clear consensus. I mean, one thing we talk yeah. about on our team is is care. We can't teach people care, but care is a huge part of our culture. Care for our teammates, mm. care for our clients. Care is a yeah. huge, huge, huge thing. And it comes up all the time. And what's interesting is it ends up affecting ethics, right? It ends up mm-hmm. affecting... Um, just the way we interact with other human beings and our brand <laughs> yeah. and it all, once you start going down this road, I feel like you start to see it all tie together in a meaningful way that differentiates you from your competition in a really significant yep. way. Yeah. And it does, you're right. It affects, it kind of impacts everything, right? It's, it's going to, so what you've got there is your, maybe your first vital behavior, you know, like yeah. that is, yeah. this is something that's really important to us as an organization and our culture, 100%. right? So but but yeah, without that kind of like, you know, guiding guiding frame of of mm-hmm. you know, like, like a constitution, right? That people can you know, get on board with or not, right? It, it's mm-hmm. really really it's like it's like just running a computer with without you know having any clue how the the operating system works. So what you're even running? Like, am I on a PC? Or am I on a Mac? Am I on a phone? Or am I on an Android? I don't have any right like. It's just confusion. <laughs> I don't know, right? if, but if it's you don't out understand. There. Yeah. 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 If you I don't understand like your operating that. system, which is how yeah, which is how a lot of companies feel, honestly, right? They feel mm. that kind of like, you know, unmoored, uncentered, ungrounded mm. kind of right. They don't know who they are. And this is why. Well, and it's interesting you should bring that up because I think COVID, if anything was going to rock the boat, not to go back to our Titanic analogy, but I love that you speak in analogies too. Mm-hmm. I love analogies. But um, COVID sure rocked the boat for so many organizations culturally. In fact, my husband yeah. and I have gotten into numerous long, intense conversations about this. And he he is very much in the camp of bring everybody back. We can't have a company culture unless people are there interacting with each other. And I'm like, yeah. we built a whole company culture without sitting in the same room. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how is it doable? Yeah. Not that I'm going to ask you to play marriage counselor. <laughs> But is it doable uh, to create a culture remotely? And are we getting better at doing that? Or are we once again focusing on the things that don't really matter so much as the operating system, to use your words? Yeah. Yeah, this is such a such a great question. And I I love it. And advance apologies to your husband. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much. I got... I (laughs) started... I started a little bit of a, like a, a LinkedIn war actually with a comment I made about this particular topic a while ago. And, and oh, what I basically said was, yeah, I said, let me see if I can get this right. Um, I said, you know, if you can't do culture remotely, you never had a culture. You just had an office. I want to give a slow clap for that because that's exactly how I feel. You built yourself a beautiful building to house humans and yeah. feed them and let them use the restroom. Yeah. I wholeheartedly yeah, yeah. agree. Okay, but 
Obviously, yeah. it started a culture war. You, There's very strong feelings. Yeah. What were some of the comments you there got is. to that? Yeah. There's, well, there's a lot of people kind of misunderstanding what I was saying and saying, well, some some work needs to happen in person. And someone, I said, no, that of course it does, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. talking specifically about office culture right here, in, mm-hmm. as I mentioned in the comment. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, absolutely. There's caveats here, right? The, there are certain jobs that, that are in-person jobs. But for Building a lot a of jobs- sure. Yeah, sure. Well, a lot of a lot of jobs are not that, especially office jobs. Um, and uh, yeah, what what I tend to believe is that yeah, this is completely doable, virtually, remotely. You know, it's like this is what what we've done since the very beginning of our company. Simply because me and my business partner, we live in different states, and neither of us are going to move yeah. to the other state. So we had to figure this out. Um, and sure. Yeah, it's it is very doable. It's very possible to have a fabulous, fabulous company culture mm-hmm. and not have an office if you have the kind of work that lends itself to being able to be done that way. Um, and yeah, what I I would I would some of some of the people on my team uh, that I feel very close to. Um, yep, and I would I call them my work friends to to my yep. kids. These are my work friends. Yep. I've never met them. Right, I've, I've, yeah. right. I've, I've never, I've never sat in a room, room with them. Um, yep. But I trust them but you implicitly. Trust them intrinsically. They're fabulous yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's so ex- it's very possible. That's to funny. Think. Well, and that's exactly where we are. It's interesting how similar our companies are in that regard, uh, because it has changed. It absolutely changes everything. I think in COVID, in that we all got comfortable on Zoom, we all got used to Google Earth and all these other modalities. And at first, it was quite awkward, right? Um, let's be honest; it's like taking off the training wheels the first time um, as you're out there yeah. bike riding. But then it has become so fluid, and I feel like it's a technological language that's become so fluent. We've all had to become mm-hmm. fluent in it in so many regards, uh, and so to work in that space, I, I really care about these people on my team. And to your point, yeah, we've never sat across the table necessarily and even had a dinner together, um, which we need to do, but it hasn't inhibited the work at all, Um, which, in fact, if anything, I think it's been helpful because coming back to your point about energy, people seem to be a lot more energized when I can say, I'm going to throw a chicken in a crock pot, throw in a load of laundry, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to go into deep work mode. I'm going to get in that flow zone and I'm going to start cranking away on this without thinking, Oh gosh, is everything falling apart back at home or is, you know, or what about all my coworkers and all of the office politics, right? Um, A lot of that hubbub and kind of white noise, it gets removed when you have the option of of putting together a remote team. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think what people uh, maybe like your husband are, are, are missing, Mm -hmm. like just literally, literally missing, they're, they're missing kind of those connections that you get mm. in an office, right? It's like, and so what, mm-hmm. this is the difficult part of working virtually remotely or even hybrid. You have to find a way to kind of reinstate those connections because your proverbial water cooler mm. is gone, right? Like that yeah, doesn't exist, real. right? There's, there are no, there are no colli- random collisions in the hallway. There are no passing no. conversations as someone walks by someone else's desk, right? That stuff doesn't exist in the world of, mm. of virtual rem- or remote. And so you've got to find a way to, recreate that, that kind mm-hmm. of like being mm-hmm. human together space, right? And so companies who do this well and do good culture well virtually or remotely, that's what they've done, right? They figured out a way to kind of replicate those water cooler moments. Uh, mm. And that's, mm. I think that's a huge part of what people who say, oh, no, I need to be in the office. And they feel like mm-hmm. they would miss that. And they would, yeah. if unless their, their virtual company does this in a different way. So my question is the how, how do we do it in a different way? Like how do we replicate? Like how I know for our team, we love Slack. We use Slack Mm -hmm. all the time and it's great. You can just do a backsplash, Zoom and voila, up pops your person, right? Super duper helpful. How do you, what are the other ways we create virtual water coolers and we build this culture despite distance? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, and we're, we're drifting a little bit, you know, into the, to the product that we offer, which is called love work. Um, so I can mm. talk about that if you want to, um, Go ahead. but what we're, what we're really about, right. What we're really about is, is actually creating more human moments in the mm. work itself. Right. So I, you know, 
Mm. I think some of the more traditional answers you might get if you ask people this question, it's like, do a virtual happy hour, right? Like that kind of stuff. And all that's fine. <laughs> I don't like, want to come to a virtual like, happy hour. I'm not going to lie, Josh. That's not my happy exactly. place. <laughs> Exactly. That's, but it doesn't work for everybody. So you, yeah. so from our perspective, you've got to find a way to get the humanity into the workflow, right? And so this mm. is what, what love work does, right? It helps give people a structure to be able to meet with their team on a weekly basis and get a little bit of team building, you know, in 15 minutes a week. And so it's mm. just, it's mm. just, so creating some simple patterns to help your team yep. be human with each other. We have an all hands every, every Monday. We start with gratitude, right? So everyone mm. we do a round, right? Everybody gets to say, Hey, I'm great. What are you? So we ask everybody, what are you grateful for today? And then how are you checking in? Like, what are you checking in upset? Mm. Are you checking in happy? Are you checking in whatever? Mm. Right. Mm. There's no judgment. We just want to know how you're showing up today. Right. So it's just a, it's just the so most, powerful. we take a half hour and, and that's what we do. We do that check in and then we we watch our what we call a huddle video which is part of the love work experience and uh we do that together it takes a half hour for us once a week um and it really like creates those those same kind of bonds that you feel in like a team building offsite but we do it just yep. in a little bite sized way every week I love that you're bringing up the how are you checking in today because that's one thing I've really noticed especially after COVID and because we've all been behind machines for so long is sometimes it's easier to have a lot bigger feelings and not have a filter on those feelings. In fact, it was interesting. Mm. I was on the phone um, with a, a personal issue today. And I said to the gentleman who answered, I said, I am very irate, but I am sure you are a lovely individual and I don't want you to think I'm mad at you in any way, but I need you to help me solve this problem. Because I thought if this poor gentleman is picking up the phone, he's going to be like, good gosh, lady, get a grip, yeah. right? And like, why do you, why are you hating on me? I'm showing up to help you. And right. I just think sometimes that whole idea of just saying, hang on, let me take my emotional temperature, tell you what it is and that it's not your fault. Um, yep. Man, does that change the dialogue and the narrative instead of, Wow, Sally yeah. May come came to the Monday meeting and I don't know what I ever did to her, but she's real mad at me. And that just it just prevents so much yep. clutter in yep. the emotional yep. realm of an office. It's so powerful, it does. Josh. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It's really We're we call put, that the, Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we, we we call that the power of the pause, right? So taking a pause before you right. So you don't react, you respond. Right. And that's mm. what that's what the power of a pause does. And it's really hard to do. But it's really mm -hmm. one of one of the most powerful tools we've got. Oh, absolutely. I think of that and the implied versus the inferred. Realize that what mm. the speaker implies may not be what you inferred. And that could be your emotional state. <laughs> yeah. It could be their emotional state. You just never know yeah. on any given day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to talk about this idea of management being completely outdated technology. This is sure. a premise you put forth. I that caught my eye. Um, tell me more. And tell me why. Sure. So we want to distinguish pretty immediately between management and leadership, right? So mm, just to make that as sure. a distinction, um, management really is a technology. So if we understand kind of the, the word technology, it's applying science to behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so this is really what managers are doing, right? So right, it's, it's a technology that was invented to... Mm kind of prevent the, the idea was that most people are dumb and can't make decisions. And so we need to find the smart people to make the decisions for all the dumb people. And therefore we invented managers to do that. L literally, this is, this is basically how it Which was, how this idea totally, but that's, I, that's how this idea came about in the early 19th mm -hmm. century. So or early 20th mm -hmm. century. And sure. so industrial revolution. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, right. I don't think we find a lot of managers today who would say, yeah, all my people are dumb, right. I, they need me to make all the decisions for, right. Like they're not going to, like, that's not what they're going to say. But the reality is that this hierarchy thing, when we're just mm. giving people power over other people, simply because there needs to be people that have power over other people. <laughs> and once right, again, this, why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That that's what we call a fiat hierarchy, right? It's like it's mm -hmm. it's power just for the sake that some people need it, or we think they right. What it does is it creates this 
really dangerous dynamic where the people underneath that manager feel completely disempowered to make any decisions ever. It's like sucking all the oxygen out of a room and then telling someone to run a marathon. It is. It is. And so compare that though with leadership, which I would say is not a a hierarchy of of, um, just kind of granted power, right? It's not because you just, right? If you're a leader, that that Mm. means that you have people following you. And they're following you because they, they want to. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a different kind of hierarchy. It's a hierarchy of expertise. And it's like, mm. hey, or vision or passion, right? I'm following you because I believe in what the, the vision for the future that you have is so compelling. I want to go with you there. Mm. Right. And that is a mm. completely different kind of hierarchy, right? It's, it's a mm. voluntary mm. one. It's saying, I want to go where you're going because, man, you've captured my heart or my mind or whatever. Right. And that stuff is really powerful. But this kind of like somebody has power over me simply because they're my manager, not because they have any expertise or they've earned my trust in any fashion, but just because they're my manager, like that shit is Mm. really dangerous. Right. And that's why I say it's out, it's outdated technology. Right. Like it's, we get so much more out of people. Uh, and people are are able to give so much more of themselves. Mm. Right. Both of those things happen when we don't do this weird coercion thing that happens yeah. using the technology of management of people. Lots of things need to be managed, by the way, right? Like processes, sure. systems, technology, all that crap needs to be Spreadsheets, managed. Spreadsheets, data. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But people do manage not- Manage your heart out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But people do not yeah. need to be managed. They they want to be led. Uh, Gosh, so that's, that's so what true. I don't know anybody who says- Yes, I love having a manager who micromanages me and right. tells me what to do. My no. day is so much Everybody better because I have it. that person in my life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a total and joy. You know who suck. hates it, and you know who hates it too is the manager. Right, the man. People hate <laughs> my, right, like they hate feeling like they have yeah. to babysit people. Right? Everybody hates this system. It's just stupid, um, and it's yeah, it's just outdated technology uh, that we haven't yeah. replaced. Hundred percent agree, especially and it goes back to that whole energized place of operating. It's you can't be energized when you have someone micromanaging you and telling you exactly where to put each widget. When you have autonomy, and this is another reason I love remote work, is because there is autonomy and yep. there are deliverables. And how you get there, cho- you know, choose your own path, so to speak. But the reality yep. is, like at the end of the day, the deliverables have to be there. Different things work for different people. The way you get there, we don't care but we just want you to get there, yeah. right? And if you're operating yeah. from that place of joy and happiness, you're going to find a way to get there, back to your axis, right? Like we're pushing ourselves yeah. just the nth degree further, but we can do it in the safe comfort of whatever that is for each of us and yep. produce incredible results for the client and the firm. Yep, absolutely. Okay, one thing we always talk about is work-life <clears throat> balance because it is great to talk about <clears throat> all of this. And I think one of the things that's always missing is a conversation about family. Your kids are home today. Mm. My kids are home today. <laughs> if you hear background noise, everybody's got kids home today, even though it's a Friday. Um, yep. But in thinking through that, how do you encourage in a culture work-life balance? Because as a woman, it means a lot more to me than giving me a breastfeeding station or a pumping station mm. or saying we have one day a year where you can bring your kids to work. How do we create a culture that is family-friendly and acknowledges hey, this isn't the 1950s where the wife stayed home with the kids and the husband went off to work. We all have dynamic careers and we all have multiple competing interests. And a lot of us have kids. How do we create create a culture that embodies that? Yeah. So yeah, I I don't, I don't really believe in in work-life balance. It's, it's really, Mm. I think a much better word is integration, right? Like you're at work. It feels a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're at work a lot, right? If you're like most yeah. people, like it's the thing you spend the majority of your waking hours thinking about, focused on and doing. Um, so there's, Agreed. there's no and real balance. Hours. Yeah. And there's no real balance to that. Right. Like, and so, and in your work doesn't exist outside of your life, right? It, it's, mm. this is all your life. You look at your calendar, that's mm. your life, right? Like that's my mm. life when I look at, right. Yeah. So yeah, so there isn't really. So That's I don't find good. the idea of balance very helpful, but um, I think the idea of integration and flexibility, 
becomes really important here. And so from the organizational standpoint, flexibility is key and and Mm. being able to allow uh, and and really require people to come as whole people. And so this is one Mm. of our vital behaviors is be a whole Mm. person. Mm. And we need you to do that when you're at work because that's who you yeah. are. Like we don't want you to leave yourself, you know, at the at the door or you know in the car or you know upstairs before you come down the stairs for your morning commute to your desk, right? Like bring your whole person um, so you don't feel disintegrated at work. Mm. And this is right. Mm. So this is a a really important thing for organizations, right? Is to allow for that integration, allow for that whole person to come into the job and then allow for just mm. a crap, crap load of fa- flexibility, right? Like we, we need to <laughs> be able that. to be. <laughs> a crap load of flexibility. That is the best statement ever because you're right. If you think you're going to leave yourself at the door, you're then all of you isn't showing up. You're not getting the best yeah. parts of that person. Yeah. I always say I'm a better yeah. mom because I work. I'm a better worker because I'm a mom. Like they go hand yeah. in hand for me. And seeing yeah. that and embracing that, what does a crap load of flexibility look like to you? <laughs> I love it's, that it's, term. I'm so stealing this, Josh. <laughs> Please do. It really, it really just is an allowance for people to be a whole person, right? Because because stuff comes up, sure. right? It's like doctor's appointments, cannot... soccer games. Exactly. Where do we start? Yeah. And we all know it's going to come up, right? And it's like, and oh my goodness, my landlord did this. And oh my goodness, mm. man, something happened to my mom and I need to go get her from the airport. And right, like all of this stuff is happening all the time. And so it's just, mm. be, let's be flexible with the fact that we and all let's be know. be real about it. Yeah. Yes. We all know we have lives outside of this, mm. this work thing we do together. Mm as much as we can welcome those lives into the workplace. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's one of those things that will help your people become inspired people, right? This is one mm-hmm. of the things that creates a culture that outperforms, right? So if you want to get, right, if you want to get back to even the business side of this, right? These are the things the that, ROI. that matter because they mm-hmm. help people feel inspired and cared for and whole. And unless your people mm. can feel like that, right? They they can't bring their mm-hmm. all their best ideas to work because they're not bringing their whole selves to work. I so agree. And one thing I am adamant that we stop as a culture, it, I, and I am always quick to correct. There's not many things I'm quick to correct, but this is one that I just it, I'm like, no, we have to stop doing this. Is so when someone says, "I'm so sorry, my kids are home today," or "I'm so sorry, I have my kids with me." When you take a business call, I'm like, of course your kids are with you. You're a human being and that's quite okay. And in fact, I have a few of my own you might hear. Like, I think just normalizing, like I just so want to normalize that not is that, that isn't a liability. In fact, to me, that's an asset that you have that because that's just me. That's my kids screaming. You can (laughs) handle a lot of different things like running a podcast while your kids are screaming, right? Um, Things like that, that I think, yeah, it, it's a value add. And instead of seeing it as a deficit organizationally, I think when a culture can see it as as an ad, man, that's a game changer, not only in employee retention, mm-hmm. satisfaction. Um, and once again, back to productivity where we started, what did you say? 220 some odd percent productivity when someone feels yeah. inspired. I feel a lot more inspired if I can be who I am, right? Yep, Exactly. Exactly. It's all, this, all this stuff is connected and it's why the, the culture topic is so important, right? To go all the way back mm-hmm. to that, right? This stuff is yeah. not, these things don't live in separate little silos, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you're not a separate person, right? Like from, yeah, like all of these things are integrated and what work they has are. done is artificially disintegrated us. And yeah. that is, that is that the term. stuff we're trying to bring, bring back together. Yeah. It's a false dichotomy that just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay. Let's do our lightning round. I love, I love, love our lightning round. If you could go back to your 20 year old Josh self, what would you say? Yeah, I think I've, I think I got two things for this one. Uh, Okay. A, uh, those like once in a lifetime crises, they're going to keep yep. happening, right? There's not going to, they're not going to be just one. There's going to be like many of these. So just like I am buckle here for up that. for that. <laughs> but you'll yep. be okay, right? Like you'll be okay, yep. but like, this is going to be a little crazy. Uh, and then yeah. the other one that I would say is, you know, be a little more thoughtful about uh, your business partners. Mm. 
I've had some, I've had mm. some pretty, pretty tough experiences, uh, and some yeah. hard learning moments, uh, with, with business partners that I've learned a lot through those experiences. Yeah. And if I could give myself a yeah. little heads up to make those things a little easier, I probably would. Absolutely. It's, it's like a dating, it's like a marriage. I mean, you really yeah. got to have your yeah. list of must haves, can't stands and choose wisely. And, and that's hard to say yeah. to a 20 year old too, sometimes, right? Yeah. Like yeah. There's not a lot I don't of time much for a lot I would of wisdom understand. in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, Sometimes yeah, you got to take try. a few laps around the block of life to get it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't um, know. Book that has most changed your life personally or professionally? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, the, I kind of have two answers for this one too. Um, Great. Is, uh, well, a, well, the first answer would be my book. Uh, so not yep. because it's, you know, fabulous or anything, but because how, how much I learned in writing it or like how oh, much it shaped. Right. So I write in order to clarify my own thinking. And so mm. writing a whole book, right, it really just clarified my thinking about what I think about the future of work. So that was really, mm. really helpful for me to do that. And I'd, I'd love to write another book. It's a great uh, exercise. You know, sometime. Yeah. The yeah. other one that came comes to mind though is, is a book called Strengths Based Leadership. Um, mm. And there's actually not that much content in this book. It's mostly about mm. a strengths assessment. Um, mm -hmm. but this book was so formative in helping me shift my thinking from a deficit mm. way of, of thinking to a strengths based mm. way of thinking, uh, mm. focusing on what's right with me instead of what's mm. wrong with me and doing that with everyone around me. That, that has just been completely transformative in the way that I, I think about the world. So I'd say that one too. Mm. And we will put links to both of those in the show notes if you're listening or watching so that you can just click right on through. And then finally, I'm I'm interested in your, if you're even going to like our last question, time hack. Do you believe in time hacks? And if so, what is your best one? I feel like I have to preface yeah. this, but now that we've had this conversation today. Yeah. All right. Two two answers for this one too. Uh, All first, right. first one is I, I do think there's something to it. Uh, and, and the most important thing that I do is to get everything out of my head. Right. I get yeah. it. And it doesn't matter where you put it, put it in a place that works for you. For me, it's, it's my Apple notes, right? So everything oh, you're way more out of my head than I am. Cause this is where, this is where I'm at. And I go through these and, with great regularity. <laughs> and that's why I say, do what works for you, right? Like yeah. whatever, it doesn't matter where you put it, but put it somewhere that's, that, that's get it organized, out. but get it out of your head. Uh, and then the second thing I will say, though, kind of maybe to your point, is I, I don't really believe in, in too mm -hmm. much of this. I would say stop focusing on time so much and focus on energy instead. Uh, but there's, yeah. there's more to be gained in working with your energy and, mm. and trying to do more things during the times of day when you feel energized and doing more activities that you feel energized doing and right. Like putting other people Absolutely. around you who can do the things that drain your energy, right? There's way more to be yeah. gained from energy management than time management, uh, in my perspective. And so I would say, mm. look, look there. I totally agree with you. In fact, it's often confused when we're interviewing potential, um, folks uh, to add to our team, a lot of people ask for strengths and weaknesses and we ask for what is your happy place and what is your not so happy place? And everybody has them. Once again, yeah. let's just talk about them and be candid. And if it's not a happy place for you, let's find somebody where it is their happy place. Cause there is somebody out there that was meant to do whatever that is, you know? Yep. And the yep. difference is so dramatic. Josh, such a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. If you have any questions for Josh, we'll put links at the bottom um, to all of his materials. And what a really great conversation. Thanks for sharing your expertise today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.